Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 19. And I want to read the, this, uh, this passage here, beginning in verse 23. The scene, of course, is uh, at the cross of uh, Jesus. So John writes, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldier did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So of course this is the way John writes, very much like a play, if you wish. This is a close-up here, okay? A close-up look at a family dealing with a crushing event in their lives. Obviously the big picture is the crucifixion of Jesus, but he kind of zooms in at the end there, and he mentions three women that are at the, at the cross. So in an historical context, this is the Son of God dying for the sins of all mankind, bidding farewell to His earthly family. But on a more personal and immediate note, it is a man being executed in public, and as we note, I think there's one more uh, verse here where it says, when Jesus then saw His mother and the disciple whom He loved standing nearby, He said to His mother, woman, behold your son, then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. So the big picture, the crucifixion, the Son of God. The more intimate uh, note uh, is a man being executed in public, and making arrangements <laughs> for, the care of his, for the care of his mother. And while we have this close-up in view, have you noticed yet that there were three women who were at the foot of the cross during Jesus' darkest hour? And the interesting thing, all three women are named Mary. So in this you know, lesson this morning, I'd like to describe the relationship between these women and how three Marys ended up at the cross of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about the first Mary, shall we? the mother of Jesus, earthly mother of Jesus. The name that she carries, along with the other two, appears in the Greek New Testament as Maria or Miriam. Uh, these were Greek versions of the Hebrew name Miriam, uh, which was actually the name of Moses' sister. Uh, most of what we know about her comes from either Matthew's Gospel or Luke's early account of Jesus' life. I think we're very familiar with her. Uh, she lived in Nazareth. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a carpenter. Uh, she conceived the child through the power of the Holy Spirit and then visited her cousin Elizabeth during her pregnancy. After being informed of this fact by God, Joseph uh, took her as his wife and soon after uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. She and her family lived for a while in Egypt, but eventually settled back into life at Nazareth, uh, which was their hometown. Doesn't that sound so normal when you read it like that? You know, we were in Choctaw, or we, I grew up in Choctaw, I went to school in Tulsa, and then we moved to, you know, we moved to Missouri for a while, and then I got a job. You know, <laughs> they were here, they moved there, they went to Egypt, they came back, they went back to their hometown. So, uh, such an ordinary story. Luke, in his gospel, records an episode some 12 years later when she and Joseph anxiously searched for Jesus, thinking Him lost, but they found Him in the temple. As parents, haven't we had somewhat that experience? For a moment, you know, losing sight of a child at Walmarts or at the department store or something, a little guy gets away from you and you have those five terrible moments, or five terrible minutes where you're looking You know, we can relate to this. After this episode, you know, where she finds him in the temple, you know, they're relieved, they thought they'd lost him. 
They, did, they weren't thinking we lost the Son of God, they were thinking we lost our kid. Where is he? He's 12, I mean he's old enough, but 12, he's still, he's still a little boy. So after this episode, we don't actually see Mary or Jesus for that fact until he begins his public mis, uh, ministry. Um, we know that Mary didn't follow Jesus on his ministry journeys, but we do see them together at a wedding early in his ministry. Um, what she thought of Jesus during this time, not known. It says she kept things in her heart. She didn't kind of you know, talk about it. We do know, however, that when Jesus was still a baby and prophecies about his future were made by Simeon and Anna, uh, the Bible says she was amazed. And when she found Jesus in the temple as a boy and he admonished her that he was in his father's house, Mary treasured or pondered over these words in her heart. Seems to me Mary was a woman of kind of few words. She wasn't a talkative type. During his ministry, there's another episode described by Mark where Jesus' family, including Mary, seek to speak to Jesus. They want to talk to him because they were concerned about his personal welfare as his ministry was beginning to cause a great stir among the people. He was causing trouble. People were talking negatively about him. Again, isn't that normal? His mom, his brothers, they come and they, they want to bring him home. They Listen, come home for a while. Let's wait till all this stuff settles down a bit. You don't, you don't want to be getting into trouble. You know, it's a, you're doing good with your ministry. We're happy with that. Come home. You know, let's, whew, let's have a little cool down period. That's what they were there for. In Mark 3, Jesus responds to his earthly family by declaring that fidelity to the spiritual family has priority over fidelity to one's earthly family, even one's own family. And then the final scene where we actually see Jesus and His mother together is at the foot of the cross where He tenderly gives over the responsibility for her care to John, His beloved apostle. And then we see Mary one more time and it is when she is in the upper room along with the apostles and other family members and disciples after Jesus' resurrection in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Again, a woman not of many words but we do see her at key moments throughout Jesus' life. All right, let's look at another Mary. Uh, Mary, the sister of Mary. The second Mary we see at the foot of the cross, as I said, is Mary, her sister, the sister of Jesus' mother, earthly mother. Now it may seem odd that two sisters have the same name, but there are some explanations for this. Uh, the original name in Hebrew had several versions, Miriam, Mariah or Maria, and they could have used two versions of the same name. That's you know, often uh, what took place in families of that, of that generation or that time. Uh, these two Marys uh, could have been brought into the same family through subsequent marriages by their parents. You know, there was divorce in those days too. There were blended families in those days as well. Widows, you know, children brought together, cousins, whatever. The Bible definitely says that they are sisters and says that the second Mary was the wife of Clopas. Now some ancient manuscripts have margin notes saying that this Clopas, who is also called Altheus in other places, was the brother of Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. So this would mean that two brothers, Joseph and Clopas, married two sisters who either had similar names or were part of a blended family. Is that like too hard to believe? No, that's not too hard to believe. I know people, brothers, who, you know, two brothers married. And especially in those days, you know, small villages, the boys you knew were probably the boys that your brother knew, right? Your cousin knew. There were enclosed societies. Cousins married cousins, you know what I mean? In addition to this, Mark tells us in Mark 15, 47, that she was the mother of James the Less 
and Joseph. Now James called the less because he was either younger or shorter than the other apostle named James. Uh, he became one of the 12 apostles. So we have several sightings of this second Mary throughout the New Testament. Matthew 27, 54 tells us that she was one of the women who had followed his ministry from its early days in Galilee and had supported the Lord. Uh, she was present at the crucifixion, as we read in John. She's at the empty tomb on resurrection morning, Matthew 28, 1, having brought spices to properly bury the body. The body of who? Her nephew. Is that again so crazy or so wild to believe? A small society. Most of his apostles came from where he lived. She was among the women who reported the resurrection of Jesus to the apostles. She is probably among the people mentioned by Luke in Acts chapter 1 verse 14 where he lists the people in the upper room with the apostles. At one point he mentions the women just as a group, referring to those women who had followed and ministered to Jesus during His ministry. It's not so strange that your relative, your aunt, support your ministry. Jesus didn't go around knocking on doors asking for support. The people closest to Him were the people that became His apostles and supporters in His ministry. Again, very, very normal. Uh, in John 19, we see her supporting and comforting her sister as her nephew and her Lord is being crucified. So that's the second Mary. A third Mary that they mention, or that is mentioned by John, Mary Magdalene. Um, Magdalene is probably a reference to where she came from. Magdala was a town in the region of Galilee where Jesus was from. Uh, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we learn that Mary had been among a group of women who had been healed by Jesus of various illnesses and possession by uh, demons. In Mark 16, 9, it says, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven demons. Now this Mary was part of a group of women who followed and ministered to Jesus as well. And as Luke writes, they were contributing to their, meaning the apostles' support, out of their private means. So Mary Magdalene was an individual who was providing money for the work of the apostles and Jesus. Now, this is the only information that we have about her, uh, her initial contact with Jesus, that he cast out uh, demons from her. Now some have said that Mary Magdalene was the sinful woman, you know, the prostitute that anointed Jesus with oil. There's no biblical basis for this idea. Nowhere in the Bible does it put Mary Magdalene at Jesus' feet. Hollywood likes to, you know, Hollywood like, this is a wonderful drama here, you know. He saves her, she washes his feet, and then they, they kind of have a, a relationship. Oh, yeah, Hollywood just loves that storyline, but it's absolutely not supported anywhere uh, in the scripture. Um, in The Passion, the movie The Passion, it shows her as the adulteress saved by Jesus, you know, where, where Jesus kind of writes on the ground and you know, he is without sin, let him cast the first stone. They make Mary Magdalene that person. Again, Hollywood. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of people get their history from Hollywood. An unfortunate thing. Uh, especially their Bible history. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mary, the sister of Martha, she was the one who cleansed you know, Jesus' feet. She's that, it, was, it was her that did that. But that's not as good a storyline because she wasn't a bad girl. You see what I'm saying? She was a good girl. So Mary Magdalene followed and supported Jesus' ministry right up to and including His crucifixion. She's among the women who go to Jesus' tomb and when they find Him gone, she tells Peter and John what has happened. But here's the interesting part. After she tells him this, she returns to the tomb uh, when they leave. 
So the apostles, they look in, whoop, he's gone, they take off. She, she goes back and she stays there and she's crying. And at this point, John tells us that she sees two angels near the tomb and then Jesus appears to her. And she's confused at first, thinking that he is you know, the caretaker and then recognizes the Lord and tries to cling to him. And he comforts her and tells her to return to tell the apostles that she has seen the risen Lord. So this Mary, faithful disciple who had served the Lord from the beginning of his ministry, was granted the privilege not even the mother of Jesus received, and that was the opportunity to be the first person, man or woman, to witness the resurrection. That privilege went to Mary Magdalene. Now, it's interesting that there were three Marys who found themselves at the foot of the cross on that day. It's interesting because they had the same name and they were present at the most significant event in history, the death of the Son of God on a Roman cross. What's also interesting is that even though they had the same name, the way that each of them eventually came to be at that point is very different. So let's examine that, shall we? Mary, the mother of Jesus, she came to the cross, if you will, through a divine calling. God, through the angel Gabriel and through the mighty miracle, called upon her to believe. Of course, she had to submit to God's will, she had to accept as true the calling that she had, but hers was a call directly from God. Look, when an angel appears to you and performs a miracle, on you, through you, that's a calling from God. No argument there. So starting with her sense of amazement as she watched this child grow to the witness of his first miracle at Cana. See, the, Mary didn't see the resurrection, but she saw the first miracle at Cana. She was witness to that. It was almost a very private miracle, right? Only she and some of the servants knew. Mary then followed the path from divinely called servant to disciple in the, other, uh, in the upper room at Pentecost. It's only at Pentecost that we actually see her in the role of disciple. She's his mother all the way up to the, the death. She's his mother. And then at Pentecost, she's a disciple. And isn't that also a little normal too? I don't, know about, you know, I don't know about your history of your family, but the hardest person for me to talk to about the Lord and about Christianity and about the Christian life and about conversion was my own mother. She's passed away now for many, many years, but I remember when she was alive, you know, I, mean, I was her son, I had a TV show you know, on, and so on and so forth, I was preaching every Sunday. <laughs> but when I sat down and talked with her about the Bible, I was still her kid, you know? it was hard for me to teach her something. Isn't that kind of what you see here? She isn't his disciple. Only after the death do you see her up in the upper room with the other, with the other women. The prophet Simeon told Mary that one day a sword would pierce her soul and that day at the cross she felt that pain as her son and now Lord suffered on the cross. So Mary came to the cross by divine calling. Uh, Mary the uh, mother of Clopas, or uh, excuse me, Mary the wife of Clopas, uh, mother of James the less and Joseph, sister of Mary the mother of Jesus, she came to the cross by association, not by calling. She was closely connected to Jesus' family. Again, some scholars think that the two families actually shared a home after Joseph died. Because Mary had, a, you know, she had several children, she was alone. And so the two sisters, you know, again, does that seem so far-fetched? You know, my grandmother uh, had 10 children. And um, uh, in 1929, my grandfather, Joseph, who was a a policeman, a detective with the uh, Ottawa City Police Department. In 1929, he died, I think of pneumonia or something. In those days, you, you died of pneumonia. And left her in 1929 with 10 children. And so what happened? Well, 
my grandmother's mother moved in with that family and the two women together raised those 10 children. Again, people of a certain age who can remember back, that's how stuff happens, right? A tragedy happens in the family, families realign to take care of the problem. Well, a tragedy happened in the family, maybe Joseph died, who knows? So some scholars say that they, the two families lived together and this was how Mary, the wife of Clopas, uh, you know, uh, became associated with Jesus. Uh, her son, Mary, the wife of Clopas, her son was a disciple, you know, the apostle of the Lord, then an apostle of the Lord. And so through her close association with the family, she became an early disciple as well, already ministering to and supporting the work of Jesus and the apostles when he began his early work in Galilee, one of, her, one of, one of his early supporters. Uh, Mary continued in that uh, supportive role in helping her sister deal with the death of her son, Jesus, who was her nephew, and she remained faithful. Our last glimpse of her is that of being among the women to report the resurrection of Christ and then awaiting the grand day of Pentecost with the apostles in the upper room. So Mary, the wife of Clopas, she came by family association, and then Mary, uh, uh, Magdalene, she came to the cross through the mercy of Jesus, not through a divine calling, not through association, you know, somebody kind of brought her in. She came through mercy. She was a castaway. She was ill. She was possessed by demons. She was beyond hope or help in her society. If, if you had what she had, you were like, you were refuse. You were refuse. There was no use for you at all. We have a hard time in our society thinking in those terms because in our society, someone who is mentally handicapped in some way, we have so many types of services to help that individual, support that individual. In those days, you, know, you were, yeah, yeah, you were a waste. That she had seven demons says that she was seriously dysfunctional, seriously disconnected emotionally and physically and spiritually. And Jesus personally cast out her demons and brought her back to her right mind. And from that time she served and supported his ministry along with the other women. And you know, today we hear support. You know, I've been a missionary, I've been knocked on I don't know how many doors to raise support. And it's usually a check that I'm looking for, you know what I'm saying? To have financial support so I can do my work. Uh, here, support, you know, maybe she wasn't providing a check, but maybe she was cooking. You know, there were 12 men here. Maybe she was cooking, providing sewing, providing washing, providing, you know, these men traveled, they needed help, they needed care. So maybe it was that kind of support she provided, I'm not, I'm not sure, but. So when you read her actions, after the crucifixion, however, you get the sense that she was a strong character and she was a leader among the women. For example, she ran ahead to the tomb, it says in John 20, verse 11. And she reports to Peter and John and, and there is uh, um, joined by the other women after. And then she returns to the tomb with the apostles and then she stays behind uh, to look for the Lord. That tells me this is a woman with a mind of her own. She's not waiting around to, you know, I, well, I'll just wait here until Peter tells me what to do. I, I'm, I'm not just going to stand here and wait around until further orders. No, she, she, she runs ahead. They're gone. She says, well, maybe he's lost. She starts looking for him. She speaks to the angels. When the men see the angels, what do they do? Well, they fall on their face. <laughs> They're afraid. She's not afraid. She talks to them. She speaks with them. Tells me that she had a, a marvelous sense of her own salvation, of her own right relationship with God, to be able to see an angel and nevertheless speak to them. She sees Jesus first. 
She's the one given the message to the apostles that He is risen and will ascend to the Father. Imagine, God chooses a woman to be the first to see and then announce the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a, what a marvelous privilege that is. Not given to 12 men who were specifically trained by Jesus for three years, who witnessed all kinds of miracles, who themselves did miraculous things, not to one of them that He gave, that he gave this uh, privilege to, uh, but to Mary Magdalene, this woman received. And you know what, I, I don't even want to emphasize the gender, this woman, this person. There was something about this person that the Lord somehow saw and entrusted to this person the first witness of the resurrection. So her initial contact with the mercy of the Lord drew her to follow Him, not only to the cross, but beyond the cross and into the tomb where she was rewarded by His glorious resurrection. Okay, so aside from the interest of knowing more about the three Marys at the cross on that day, uh, my lesson this morning is also about how most people find their way to the cross. A kind of an application here. For some, the way to the cross is that they receive God's calling. Now this is a tricky thing to explain without giving the wrong idea. I'm not saying that God calls some people and rejects others, like Calvinists who teach you know, election, predestined. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But we do see Bible characters like Samuel, for example, who from an early age, they had this sensitivity to the things of God. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, they have to obey the gospel, of course, and must remain faithful like all Christians, but somehow their heart is tuned to God from an early age. You can, you can refuse to respond or you can kill the desire to know God. Let's face it, Saul, the king, he did it. Demas in the New Testament, he did it. Certainly Judas did it. But some people, you know, they're, just, they're more attuned to the spiritual than others. It's like some people can hit a hundred mile an hour fastball or they can hit a curve ball. You know, they, just, they just know how to do that. Or some, be, some people can throw a football 70 yards at a target. They can just do that. And then there are other people somehow that have this spiritual, oh, you know, very, very sensitive to spiritual things. They're not better people, they just have this thing. So I believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was one of these people. Her answer to Gabriel is so you know, spiritually minded, so sensitive. Her greeting to Elizabeth demonstrates, you know, most of her greeting that she, when she greets Elizabeth, most of that there are quotes from the Old Testament. It means here was a woman who really knew God's word. These things show that she was already highly sensitive and ready for God's calling. It's the same way today. Some people are like this. They're always searching. They're never satisfied in the desire for God's will and purpose for their lives. They're open to God's calling. Some people come to the cross by association. How many times have I heard brothers say to me, boy, if it weren't for my, the prayers and the encouragement of my wife or my mother, I would have never known Christ. How, how many men do I know have said that to me? This is the way actually that most people come to the cross. They're led there by somebody else, a friend, a relative, a spouse, a parent, uh, you know, the minister in the church. You know, they come by association. It's the most common way that people come to the Lord. Mary, the wife of Clopas, she was converted by watching her sister raise Jesus and by her son's association with the Savior. They brought her, they're the ones that brought her to Calvary that day. She came there through association. And then there are some that are brought through ministry. Mary Magdalene was hurting and Jesus took away that hurt. And this enabled her to hear the message 
and heal her soul. You know, the various ministries of the church, whether they be visiting the sick or helping the poor or comforting or, or teaching or counseling or one-on-one you know, -on -one, uh, evangelism, uh, whatever. All of these are an extension of Jesus' healing ministry to those who are hurting. So like Mary Magdalene, if we care for the hurts that people have, we may have an opportunity to also speak the saving message of Christ to them. So a lot of people come uh, through the ministry of the church. So these women and their stories teach us a few important spiritual lessons and I just want to finish up with, with those. Lesson number one, uh, it doesn't matter who or how you are called, the decision is always the same. Will you believe and will you obey or will you reject? That's always the same. You can be as spiritually sensitive as you want to be, but somewhere down the line you have to obey the gospel. You know, many who were called by Jesus or healed by Jesus or associated with Jesus, in the end they refused to obey Him. They refused to believe Him. You know, there were a lot of spiritually sensitive people that heard the message, but you know, they didn't quite kind of, they didn't respond. So only those who actually believe and obey gain the blessings of the calling. Lesson number two, it doesn't matter who or how you are called, the, destruction, the destination excuse me, is always the same, and that's the cross of Jesus. All roads lead to Calvary. You know the old story, you know, all roads lead to Rome? Well actually, in truth, all roads lead to Calvary. Eventually, Every person has to pick their cross and follow Jesus. You know, the old saying, no, crown, no, no cross, no crown, that's very true. Everyone has a cross to bear in some way, shape, or form. And then lesson number three, it doesn't matter who or how you are called, the future is always the same. Resurrection with Jesus Christ. You know, the Roman Catholics, um, try to make the resurrection of Mary, the mother of Jesus, very special by saying that you know, she didn't see death and she was brought up to heaven in bodily form, you know, like Enoch in the Old Testament, she didn't see death. That's a Catholic doctrine, it's called the doctrine of the Assumption. Of course, there's no biblical support for this very human uh, idea or theory. That's not to say that Mary's resurrection won't be special, but it won't be any more special than your resurrection or my resurrection. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will, arrive, uh, uh, will arise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul explains that the faithful, and that includes the three Marys, as well as you and I, will rise out of the grave to a glorious eternity when Jesus returns. So I conclude our lesson today about the Marys with the simple question, how is God calling you today? You need to remember that. Is, it doing, is He doing it through a, a hungry heart? Is He doing it through an encouraging friend or other or through a kindness or service by one of His disciples? I always encourage folks not to put off responding to Jesus by faith and obedience. And that faith and obedience always, always will lead someone to the cross of Christ and then ultimately to eternal life. Okay, so that's our lesson on the three Marys. Hope that gave you some information and background on these uh, kind of, you know, you don't see them a lot, but very important characters in the story of Jesus and His ministry. Thank you very much for your attention.